Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our series on prosthodontics. Like all my videos, I'm going to be focusing on the highest yield things you need to know for the board exam. So in this video, we're going to talk about jaw relations, occlusion, and how we capture this information and use it to treatment plan prosthodontic cases. So first, it's important to talk about how to capture the arrangement of teeth in a patient. In a future video, I'll talk about all the different impression materials out there, but alginate is certainly the most universally used material, excluding digital impressions, and the material of choice for diagnostic casts. So we're going to talk about it uh, for just a few minutes here. And casts are basically molds of your teeth, and they look a little bit like this. So alginate is made up of several components, sodium or potassium salts of alginic acid, which react chemically with calcium sulfate to produce insoluble calcium alginate. There's this component in the alginate powder called diatomaceous earth, which adds strength to the impression material, and trisodium phosphate controls the setting reaction. That's probably the only compound I would commit to memory for the board exam in case that comes up in a question. So these three bullet points all have to do with the alginate powder, which you then mix with some preset amount of water depending on the alginate you're using. And you want to make sure you have enough bulk of your impression material, because more bulk means less susceptibility to unwanted dimensional changes. So the alginate should be sufficiently thick in order to capture the anatomy of the patient's teeth accurately. That's incredibly important for the purposes of taking an impression. So depending on what impression material you're using, about two to three minutes generally is the amount of time that you'll have to keep that impression tray seated in the patient's mouth before the impression material sets, and then at which point you can remove that tray from the patient's mouth. Next, you would pour that impression within about 15 minutes. And by pour the impression, I mean you mix a special powder and water together to make a stone paste that we literally pour into this impression, and it hardens to form the mold or cast of these teeth that I showed before. And then within 30 to 60 minutes, we can actually separate the casts from the impression and then throw away the impression, leaving just these casts that we can study and use um, in some of the steps that I'll talk about later. All right, so one of the central concepts I'm going to be talking about in this video is a concept called maxillomandibular relations, or MMR for short. So let's break down this term. Maxillo is, of course, referring to the maxilla, or the upper jaw and its teeth, and mandibular referring to the mandible, or the lower jaw and its teeth. So MMR is all about the relationship between the upper and lower jaws and their respective teeth. And there are basically two main relationships in which the maxillary teeth and mandibular teeth can be related to one another. And these are CR and MI. And we'll talk about both of these right now. So CR is centric relation. That's what it stands for. And the definition of CR is this first bullet point here. So CR is the position in which condyles articulate with the thinnest avascular portion of their respective discs in the most anterior superior position against the articular eminences. So that's a lot going on there. That's a lot of words. And if you could commit this to memory eventually, it would be fantastic because this definition is just a perfect representation of what CR is. And it does appear uh, on the board exam and knowing all of these things about it is very, very important. But even better would be to really understand what it all means. So I underline and bolded condyles because that's what's important with the CR relationship. So here in this picture, we have, of course, a condyle, and the jaw would come down, um, down here and to the right. And up here, we have 
the glenoid fossa, and then the articular eminence coming down this way. So this is the temporomandibular joint complex and all of the things that it contains. So going back to the definition here, I'm going to um, get my pen ready. The, it's talking about the condyles articulating with the thinnest avascular portion of their respective discs. So of course there are two condyles, one on the right and one on the left side of our mandible, and they each are, are articulating with this disc here. And so I will outline the disc um, with this red pen here. So this beige colored structure is the articular disc that the condyle is constantly in contact with. And the definition is referring to the fact that centric relation is when the condyles are in the most anterior and superior position. And that's what those arrows are referring to here. And you can tell that this portion of the disc, in contrast to this portion and this portion, is the thinnest portion of the articular disc. So this is a very good representation of what centric relation looks like, where the condyle is in some ways at home or at rest, and it's in the most anterior and superior position, articulating with the thinnest portion of the disc. Now notice, I didn't mention anything about the teeth in this scenario. And this image, in fact, doesn't have any teeth depicted on it. And that's because the teeth really aren't important in centric relation. It's all about the condyles. So centric relation is completely independent of teeth. And this is, I think this is a very helpful way to think about centric relation, especially when we contrast it to maximum intercuspation, which is our MI. That's our other big, big um, position in terms of maxillomandibular relations. So maximum intercuspation, also sometimes referred to as centric occlusion, I want to include that as well, has to do with the complete interdigitation of the teeth. So this is in complete contrast to centric relation, even though they might look similar clinically if you were just to look at their smile, and we'll talk about how to differentiate that in a second. But maximum intercuspation is all about the teeth. We want the teeth to be completely locked together. So the teeth are at home, and the condyle, we don't really care about that anymore. So whereas in centric relation, it was all about the condyle, and we were not really concerned about where the teeth were, maximum intercuspation is the opposite. This is where the teeth are locked together, and we don't really care about where the condyles are. That might be a little bit of an oversimplification, but I think it really, really helps to put this all together, big picture thinking, especially for the board's exam. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the distinctions between these two positions. So maximum intercuspation and centric relation, which I'll just refer to from now on as MI and CR for both of our sakes. <laughs> so MI and CR coincide in only 10% of the population. That means 90% of patients have a different CR, where the condyles are at rest, and MI position, where the teeth are at rest. And in these 90% of people, there's actually a slide in centric. That means where the teeth slide together between these two positions. Now, some of my earliest videos on this channel that I made several years ago cover this topic of occlusion and Passault's diagram fairly comprehensively. So I'll leave links in the description for both of those occlusion videos. Now, casts of the teeth can be mounted on an articulator, which we will cover later in this video, in either of these two positions, CR or MI. We use MI particularly or generally when a single crown or bridge is done and the interlocking of teeth can be maintained before and after the procedure. So if the patient's teeth really lock together well, 
and you can reliably do what's called hand articulation, where you put the two casts together just by hand and you can kind of feel the teeth lock together and be pretty stable in a certain position, that's when MI could be a very good way to mount the casts, again, which we'll talk about in just a second. Now, CR is used for mounting casts in nearly every other situation. And CR is so important because what if you have a patient without any teeth, which we would call fully edentulous? Or what if there's a patient that has uh, lots of posterior teeth missing or with lots of malalignment or class three bite issues? CR is better to use and more reliable in these situations. And particularly thinking back to the patient without any teeth, well, they don't have an MI position because they have no teeth, but they still have condyles, and that's what's important. So for those patients where uh, MI is impossible to maintain, like in complete dentures, or we're doing a full mouth reconstruction where every tooth is going to become crown and bridge work, CR is better to use and more reliable than MI because their teeth may not lock together in a particular repeatable position, or maybe they have no teeth at all. And that's just it. CR is the most reliable and reproducible jaw position of the mouth. And that's super, super important to know for all of prosthodontics, particularly for this section of the board exam. So what we've been dancing around so far is the concept of occlusal harmony. And I love this analogy so much. And that's the joints, muscles, and teeth must function in harmony, much like a door in its frame. So you can think of this analogy extending to each component of the mouth and the temporomandibular joint complex. So the hinges of the door would be the TMJ. The teeth are like the door and its frame, the frame being the stationary component, which is the maxilla, and the door being the movable component, which is the mandible. And the muscles of this complex are like the hands that you and I are using to open and close the door. So sometimes the door has a corner that's a little too long and the door doesn't close all the way, or the frame is bent just slightly, one of the hinges is off kilter, or maybe we slammed the door too hard and just broke the thing. And I just love this analogy because you can use all of those little um, ideas and concepts to think about what goes wrong um, in a particular component of the joint muscles and teeth. So we want everything to work together in occlusal harmony. So one of the questions you may have is, well, how do you get a patient to the CR position? I understand how to get them to MI position where their teeth lock together, but the CR part is a little bit harder to understand. And this is where we're going to talk about it. So if you just tell the patient to bite together, that's probably going to be their MI position. Or maybe they have several different bites that are just not repeatable, and they bite differently every time you ask them to bite together. So the CR position may not be that patient's at-home position, particularly if their MI and CR positions don't coincide. Remember, that's 90% of patients. So one of the most accurate methods to obtain an accurate CR inner occlusal record is with bimanual manipulation. And the inter occlusal record uh, portion I'm talking about is made with either wax or uh, polyvinyl siloxane, which is also known as PVS. And it's a registration or physical capturing of the relationship between the upper and lower teeth made with an elastomeric material like uh, PVS, for instance. And it looks uh, something like this. The patient would essentially bite together into it. This material would set and later would allow you to mount your diagnostic casts together in ideally that same relationship. So with the patient lying back, like in this picture, support the posterior mandible with fingers and the chin with the thumbs. And your idea with bimanual manipulation 
is to deprogram the jaw. What this means is basically have the patient relax their jaw as much as possible. So you can manipulate it in your hands and you want to gently direct their jaw so the condyles are in the most superior and anterior position because that's what centric relation was all about. And then once you uh, can access that centric relation position, you can swing the mandible until you get one tooth contact. So that's what I'm talking about when I say identify the first CR tooth contact and repeat until you identify a consistent first tooth contact. Because since 90% of patients don't have the same MI and CR, CR is likely not going to be where all the teeth just lock together instantaneously. You'll have the condyles in their centric relation position, and then as you close the mandible, there might be one or two or maybe three teeth that contact first um, with an opposing tooth, and that's and if you can consistently reproduce those first tooth contacts, you know you're in CR. So that you can do a couple times, and then uh, what you would do at that point, the ideal CR record would involve keeping the teeth slightly apart in the CR position, and then finally taking a record of the back teeth with that PVS material. So you might only capture the posterior teeth, say premolars and molars, for an ideal CR because you don't want the anterior teeth to get in the way. So we've talked about capturing the teeth of the patient with the alginate and capturing how they bite together with the CR slash MI record. But we're missing one more piece of information before we can mount this case on an articulator, and that is the face bow record. So the objective with the face bow record is to duplicate on the articulator the relationship of the maxillary arch to the skull and, indirectly, the mandible to the rotational center of the TMJs that exists for that particular patient. Okay, so a, another bunch of, uh, lots of words here. So let's define and simplify this. So this is a face bow. Um, it is basically a conglomeration of a bunch of mechanical components that make various measurements. And that face bow would hook up onto an articulator here and tell you where that maxillary cast should go relative to the hinge axis of the articulator. And there are two different kinds of face bows. We have the arbitrary face bow, which orients the maxillary cast to the skull via the external auditory meatus to stabilize the bow. Essentially, the face bow is fit into um, the patient's ears like earbuds, whereas the kinematic face bow is a little bit more complex and it's placed directly on the hinge axis of the mandible. So you can think of the arbitrary face bow being a little bit less precise, but more easy to use. So basically how I think of it is the face bow record transfers the relationship between the maxilla and the rest of the skull from the patient to the articulator. So we know where the maxillary cast or the upper cast is going to be positioned where we mount it onto the articulator. So next, let's talk about articulators in the next slide. So I love this, well, I love both of these pictures actually, because this one in particular shows how the articulator functions as an analog to the human skull uh, with the maxilla and mandible and all of that. So the upper member of the articulator, that's this component here, and this component in blue on this image, is an analog to the patient's maxilla. The lower member, which is this part here, and this part in yellow, is an analog to the patient's mandible. And then you have the hinge axis of the articulator, which is an analog to the patient's TMJ. So it's really cool how this all works together. Again, the face bow record transfers the relationship between maxilla and the rest of the skull from the patient to the articulator. So you use the face bow to tell you where this maxillary cast is going to go. Is it going to go a little bit forward, a little bit more back, a little up, a little tilted or canted one way or the other? That's what the face bow is for. The interocclusal record, or the bite registration that we talked about uh, previously, 
transfers the relationship between maxilla and mandible from the patient to the articulator. So you use the record to mount the mandibular cast to the maxillary cast after you use the face bow. And this would be like a wax bite registration. So you could use this once you have the maxillary cast in place from the face bow to then mount the mandibular cast to the maxillary cast. And then you have your mounting. It's a physical representation of your patient's bite outside the mouth, which is incredibly useful to us as dentists and prosthodontists doing prosthetic work, doing operative procedures. This is just something that really can't be beat, and articulators and mounted cases are so incredibly useful. So let's talk a little bit about the different types of articulators. So we have the non-adjustable articulator first, and we're basically going to go from the most simple form of articulator to the most complex. So non-adjustable articulator does not reproduce the full range of mandibular movement. Basically, it opens up and down, much like a door hinge. Whereas we know that the, um, the patient and their mouth functions much more complex than that. There's a lot more dynamic movement that goes on. And again, this is um, sort of demonstrated in Passault's diagram, which I talked about uh, in my first occlusion videos. We know the mandible is a lot more dynamic than just opening and, and closing. There's a rotation phase followed by a sliding phase. And this articulator just simply cannot replicate the complications of mandibular movement. So it falls short in that regard just a little bit. Also, the distance between the hinge and the teeth is significantly shorter in the patient. So you can see here that the distance uh, between, you know, where the teeth would go somewhere here, let's say, and the hinge axis over here is much shorter than what would be in the patient. Um, and so that's just not that's just another shortcoming of the non-adjustable articulator. And as a result, this may result in premature contacts and incorrect ridge and groove direction of the restorations. So unless you're doing a very, very simple case, everything's mounted in MI, don't have many concerns about premature contacts, occlusion concerns, maybe you can get away with a non-adjustable articulator. If you can't, then much preferred would be the semi-adjustable articulator, which is a notch above that one. So this one adds a bit more, um, a bit more customization, let's say. It allows you to set the Bennett angle and the horizontal condylar inclination, or HCI. The classic numbers to remember for the board exam are 15 degrees for Bennett angle, 30 degrees for HCI. So I again cover these concepts in my occlusion videos, but just as a refresher, the horizontal condylar inclination is basically the vertical uh, angle that condyles move as the patient's jaws function. The condyles slide down the articular eminences. And Bennett angle is essentially the horizontal angle as the condyles move laterally in function. Um, the Archon articulator and non-Archon articulator are two distinct categories that we start running into when we talk about semi-adjustable articulators. So the Archon articulator is where the condyles are part of the lower member and the fossa are part of the upper member. So what I'm talking about with the condyles in this um, image here, we can see this little gold ball here is sort of the analog to the patient's condyle, if you will, and that's directly attached to this lower member, which we said was part of the mandible. So that's pretty anatomically accurate, where the condyle's part of the mandibular bone. So, um, and then the fossa is where that golden ball sits. If I can um, erase that uh, writing there, you can see how this um, silver portion with the gold slot here would be the analog to the patient's glenoid fossa. And that's part of the upper member. So this is a, uh, a loyal and accurate anatomical analog to the patient. So that's why we call it archon. The non-archon uh, non example, excuse me, is the opposite, where 
Uh, it's not anatomically correct, and in fact, the upper and lower members are rigidly attached. So uh, those are two terms I would be familiar with, and this one, again, is an example of the Archon semi-adjustable articulator. And all of those, um, the HCI you can change here, and the Bennett angle you can change here. Um, so there's a lot more customization than with the non-adjustable articulator, where it's just a simple open and close hinge. And then we have the, um, the, the most complex articulator, the fully adjustable articulator. And this one has even more things that you can adjust, lots of uh, you know, things you can uh, mess with back here. And this is, goes a little bit beyond the scope of this video. I don't think you really need to know how this works or anything like that. Um, there's this very complex tracing process involving a pantograph, which is used to follow the patient's exact border movements. And um, yeah, again, I don't think you would need to know this for the board exam. But just for completeness sake, this is the most complex articulator out of the three we talked about. All right, so one thing I did want to mention, particularly for the board exam, is that casts poured from alginate are more accurately mounted with wax records and casts poured from elastomeric materials like the PVS, that purple material we talked about, um, and it comes in many different colors, are more accurately mounted with elastomeric materials or zinc oxide eugenol paste. So this is something that, one of those kind of random dental material facts that I would commit to memory for the board exam. But the nice thing here is that if you pour the casts from an elastomeric impression, it's best to mount them with the same kind of material. All right, so if occlusion is all about teeth functioning together, disclusion is where the teeth are separating from one another in function. And that's to in order to protect the teeth from wearing and uh, receiving too much occlusal force and potential trauma. So let's talk a little bit about disclusion because this is really important we're talking about um, making prosthetic teeth and using our mounted cases in order to determine how to build up those prosthetic teeth. So again, this slide is all about disclusion when the patient is protruding the lower jaw forward, as shown in this image here. So this, these two concepts have to do with the patient protruding the jaw straight forward. So our four, uh, we have one posterior determinant of occlusion and one anterior determinant of occlusion. And these two concepts are extremely important for the board exam. So condylar guidance has to do with the condyles, which are, of course, in the posterior portion of the mouth. So it is the posterior determinant of occlusion. And this has to do with the slope of the articular eminence and it's represented by that horizontal condylar inclination that we just briefly mentioned before on the articulator. So let me um, get my pen out here again and highlight for you, this is the slope of the articular eminence, that when the condyle is, or when the jaw is being protruded forward, the condyle is being forced to slide down this articular eminence. So depending on the patient, they may have a different slope. Some might be more shallow and some might be steeper. And in a future video, I'll talk specifically about all of these determinants of occlusion because there's definitely a way that we can simplify it to remember just what you need to know for the board exam and it's really, really helpful. So I'll definitely talk more about that then. But there are certain things you have to remember if the articular eminence is shallower or steeper and how that would impact the teeth that you could be restoring. So anyway, you can think of it like this is sort of limiting the movement of the jaw in a certain way because the condyles have really nowhere else to go but to be guided by the articular eminence. So that's a determinant of where the teeth are going to be touching and where they're not going to be touching because the condyles really have nowhere else to go but use the articular eminences as a guide rail. Now, we also have incisal guidance, which since the incisors are in the anterior portion of the mouth, that's the anterior determinant of occlusion. 
And this is where the incisal edges of lower incisors are being, again, forced to move a certain way against the lingual slopes of the upper incisors. So I'll uh, quickly grab a new color and um, excuse my drawing here, but I will draw a cross section of an anterior tooth. This is like an incisor with the cingulum here and we'll say a lower incisor here with a um, smaller cingulum there. So these are our two teeth, upper and lower, and as you bite together and say this lower incisor is contacting um, somewhere on that cingulum, let us get a green pen, and, and the patients in, um, say, MI, for instance, they're completely, their teeth are completely interdigitated, and this tooth, this lower incisor, needs to slide forward as the jaw is moving forward. Well, if the point of that incisor is here, it really has nowhere else to go but to be guided by this tooth and the lingual surface of that incisor. It can't, you know, just break right through that incisor. So you can see how this is kind of a, an interesting situation where we have a slope from this tooth and a slope from this articular eminence. Sometimes they can be in harmony, sometimes not. And so these two determinants of occlusion, again, determine where the jaw will move, at what angle the jaw will protrude forward and down as the mandible is moved forward. And if we, again, go back to the analog, how all of this is related back to the articulator, we have this thing called a pin and a guide table on the articulator that we can use to represent incisal guidance. And I'll just mention that briefly in a following slide. All right, and just to finish up our conversation on disclusion, we also have a discluding that's occurring when the patient is moving from side to side. So this, this slide was all about uh, moving the jaw forward. This slide is all about moving the, um, or this concept of canine guidance is all about moving the jaw from side to side. So when in lateral movements, all posterior teeth are ideally immediately discluded as contact occurs solely between the upper and lower canine on the working side. So this is an ideal situation. This doesn't always happen in every patient's for sure. But the ideal scenario is that when the patient is sliding one way or the other, either right or left, the uh, canines are contacting together and discluding or separating all these posterior teeth so they don't have to feel this force. The canines are very well equipped. They have the longest roots of all the teeth and they're built in such a way to be able to handle that stress. So that is the concept behind canine guidance. And of course, the working side is the side that the mandible is moving towards. That's either right or left. Um, anterior guidance is sometimes used synonymously with canine guidance, but there's an important distinction to be had here, particularly when you're reading these terms on the board exam. Uh, I want to make clear that anterior guidance refers to both incisal guidance that was with the, um, the lower incisors gliding against the lingual surfaces of the upper incisors, that's in a protrusive movement, and canine guidance, which is this lateral disclusion where the canines are only contacting, discluding the posterior teeth. So anterior guidance, because the canines and incisors together make up the anterior teeth, is all the guidance that occurs between those two units. So um, I think that's a super helpful distinction there. So as a summary, during protrusive the incisal and condylar guidance, anterior and posterior determinants of occlusion, together provide clearance for all of the posterior teeth. So they're separated as the jaw is moving forward. During lateral, canines on the working side and the condyle on the balancing side, which we didn't talk about before, provide clearance for posterior teeth on the balancing side. That's the side that the mandible is moving away from. So this is such a cool concept because, um, as we'll talk about, it's really this concept of mutual protection 
where the front teeth uh, protect the back teeth and the back teeth protect the front teeth. It's just such a cool mechanism of occlusion and disclusion that is designed so carefully with how the teeth work together. So I mentioned briefly this idea of a guide table. Um, this is where, uh, this is the guide table of the articulator we were looking at before, the semi-adjustable articulator. And this is a mechanical one, and this is a custom one. And I'll just talk about the difference between those really quickly. Uh, anterior guidance must be preserved when restorative procedures change the surfaces of any guiding teeth. So if you're doing full anterior crowns, well, that's going to affect the guiding teeth. So we want to make sure that our anterior determinant of occlusion stays consistent. In other words, if we're changing the canines, we're replacing them with crowns, we want to make sure those surfaces are true to the surfaces that were uh, there before at some point. So we can maintain canine guidance if that's what the patient had originally. Or if that patient had a certain slope on the lingual surfaces of the anterior teeth and that was helping to disclude the posterior teeth, well, we want to maintain that too if we're replacing those with crowns. And this guide table is going to help us with that. So the mechanical incisal guide table gives insufficient information to reproduce the exact lingual contours of the maxillary anterior teeth because the lingual contours of those teeth are curved. They're not straight across. So the mechanical guide table can only do straight lines, whereas this one can be curved and more accurately represent the patient's natural anatomy. And the custom incisal guide table is made out of acrylic resin and is able to provide this information because we're, whereas this one we can't customize, this one we can customize to the patient's actual anatomy. And here's this concept of mutual protection. So we talked all about how the front teeth protect the back teeth, and that's in protrusive movements and lateral movements with that incisal guidance, that canine guidance. That's how we can protect the back teeth from feeling all of that wear from sliding. Whereas the back teeth also protect the front teeth because the back teeth have flat occlusal surfaces and strong roots nice divergent multiple roots to help protect the anterior teeth from those up and down biting forces. So it's really cool, this concept of mutual protection, how the front protects the back and also the back protects the front. All right, so that's about it for this video. I'm sorry it went on for so long, but um, I was getting excited. This is really um, cool information and central concepts to uh, how the prosthodontic world and prosthodontic treatment planning is uh, working out there. So just as a summary to review um, much of the things that I talked about, we capture teeth with alginate and we pour the diagnostic casts. We capture the bite, which is either MI or CR, with uh, wax or PBS and with a bite registration. We capture the relationship between the maxilla and the skull with a face bow. And then with all of those uh, information, we can mount to an appropriate articulator. And then we can use that mounted case to study occlusion and disclusion for that particular patient, which can then inform how we design the prosthetic teeth. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I really hope you enjoyed this video, and we'll see you in the next one.